Welcome back to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And of course, with me is the man with the plan, BQ. Say what's up to the people. Yo, what's good? What's up, everybody? Uh, look, Sorry, my cat just ran into the window like a weirdo. Um, so last few weeks were kind of weird. You know, I had computer issues for a while. And uh, finally got those fixed. And then I went out of town, had a little mini vacation in Florida. And uh, I was going to live stream out there and I was going to, you know, all this good stuff, come back and podcast. But when I was gone on my vacation, my, uh, you know, you guys know I have many cats, but the one I'm really, really close to basically ran away. Uh, That kind of took a toll on me for a few days. So that's why, you know, TW ended up doing the podcast solo last week. My, My cat did come home. I think he went looking for me. He's an outdoor cat. So I think he went looking for me when I went on vacation. So when he got let out one day, he just took off and he usually doesn't leave, you know, <laughs> past the front, uh, the front door. So, uh, so things were kind of weird. And, um, but now, but now we're good to go. I know on streaming platforms, sometimes the show's on there. Sometimes it's not it usually has to do with how I feel the particular sound quality is for that show. Or if we put an episode out way too late, you know, I, I usually just reserve it for YouTube, but you're always going to be able to find the podcast on YouTube. My cat is losing his mind over here. I don't know if you can like hear that. Um, now I kind of wish he did stay missing. What the hell? <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, back in a place to be and and um, you know, back on the ball. And hopefully, um, hopefully, TW will, be, will get back to doing a, a mailbag show this week. Yeah. So when when your your cat went missing, who was clearly now passively aggressively acting out and and torturing you while you're trying to do your podcast because uh, that's your payback for leaving, going on vacation. And then you abandon him just like uh, CM Punk did to MJF. Okay. CM Punk abandoned MJF when he needed him most. Okay. (laughs) By retiring to take care of his own life, he abandoned MJF and now MJF is going to make him pay. And similarly, this cat is going to make you pay for daring to take a vacation. So when you came back and your cat, your dear, lovely cat was missing, did it make you realize how much you actually hate your other cats? Do in a way, yeah. no, so I don't hate my other cats, <laughs> but they would come to me looking for affection and I didn't really want to give it to them because I was just like, I felt guilty. I was like, my other, you know, my other one's out there somewhere. I can't. So yeah, so they come up to me and my like, go away. <laughs> that's hilarious (laughs) so oh man i'm not a cat person so (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) um but we are glad that the cat is back back in the fold back in the place to be back in the impact lounge um real quick if you like that story go ahead and hit that like button real quick so that we know you like this video um if you want to hear more cat stories and also more impact wrestling talk Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you are subscribed to the channel. And if you want to be notified each and every time we drop some brand new fire cat related content <laughs> on this page, hit that notification bell. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you guys have done all the requisite clicking, uh, BQ, what's going on? What's on your mind in the world of Impact Wrestling this week? So I do have something on my mind that I've wanted to talk about for several weeks now, but because, you know, the aforementioned computer problems and cat problems and all that. We haven't really got a chance to just sit down and really, really knock out a good podcast. What I've been wanting to talk about, and this is a little bit overdue is, and it's not impact related, but it is impact related at the same time. And it's the, uh, the Tony Khan purchase of ring of honor and how that affects impact. And from the little you and I have discussed about it, I think we have some differing opinions, but I'm I'm of the mind that it's going to affect Impact a lot more than a lot of the perhaps the Impact diehards really realize it's going to. That that's just my personal opinion. Um, we don't know exactly what he's going to do with the company yet, but in general, I feel like it's going to hurt Impact because you know when AEW became a thing, it started becoming harder and harder for impact to sign 
these guys. I think a couple of years ago when they had the whole Slammiversary marketing campaign where we're, we're waiting for you know Black Monday from WWE and we're going to start signing these dudes, I think they truly felt like, hey, this is going to be a time of the year, every year, where we can really revamp this roster. Now, uh, you know, they've always gone to the WWE well. They've, they've always done that. But um, it was something that the current fan base was getting, you know, they, they, they like it. They get excited about it. But then AEW became a thing, and all of a sudden the well dried up a lot quicker. And for a couple years, AEW's been signing everybody. And we always say they can't sign everybody. It's impossible. Uh, you know, but now they're starting to release people and, and you know, so they can kind of continue to make these signings. But that being said, I felt before the Ring of Honor thing where they went out of business, you know, it's okay, we're kind of going out of business, whatever it is. I felt like, okay, it, it coincided with a time where I really felt like AEW really couldn't sign anybody else. Um, it's, a di- it's, it's not a good time to be a free agent right now, in my opinion. And then when Ring of Honor w- was releasing the talent, I was like, yo, Impact's going to pick up a lot of these guys, which they have picked up some, but they're going to pick up a lot of these guys. That's, that's what I felt because AEW couldn't possibly take these guys out on. And now uh, Tony Khan has said he's purchased Ring of Honor. We don't know exactly what he's going to do with it yet. They say it might be a developmental He's saying it's going to be its own show, but some people are going to come in and out. And I truly feel like when this super card of honor, I think that's the pay-per-view they got coming up. I really feel Cesaro, CSRO, whatever he's calling himself now, is going to debut there. And they can actually push that brand with him as the top guy. And I think people will really be into it. That's what I think is going to happen. I could be wrong. But I'm being long-winded about this because, you know, I want to hear what you have to say, obviously. But all in all, what I think is that Ring of Honor was always still kind of the competition to impact. That was always the the distant number two or the distant number three battle that they were mm-hmm. having um, with, the, with each other, which impact, for the most part, has, has dominated that in the sense of the overall brand. There was the hot period of Ring of Honor with Cody and the Bucks and the Bullet Club and shit like that, where it was better than, I mean, it was more popular than Impact was, but they've never had the eyes that Impact has, and they, they don't have the viewership around the world. Um, the revenue, I, I, I don't really know. Well, I guess we do, because one of them's still standing, the other one's not, but what I think overall is that it's going to be, it, it's going to hurt Impact in their ability to sign people because now Tony Khan has another platform to say, well, I I can sign people and I can bring them here. And even if they, we don't know if they're going to keep the Sinclair deals that, you know, everything's that that they already have in place. We don't know what they're going to do. Like no one has a clue. I don't think it's going to YouTube because they already got YouTube shows, but even if they're on the Sinclair networks, um, if it's a, if it's now a, a Tony Khan backed project. He's going to put the money into it. He's going to put the marketing into it that we already know he's better at doing than, than impact is. I'm concerned that that ring of honor show could be, could have, I wouldn't say more popular, but could have more eyeballs on it than impact. And Tony Khan would probably pay them more. You know, even the people at a lower level saying, hey, we're paying you per appearance. It might be a difference of $100, you know, for, for an appearance. But, but I still think that he would pay them more than Impact is paying that lower mm-hmm. tier of guys. So mm-hmm. if he's saying, hey, you can come here, it could be more eyeballs. Maybe there's not more eyeballs. We don't know. And I'm going to pay you more. It, it's... I feel like it's going to be, again, very, very difficult for them to bring on guys, especially off the indies. I think because this is the mm-hmm. tier we're talking about with the Ring of Honor product, they're not going to be signing, you know, Killer Cross and, hey, you're going to go fucking ring, wrestle in Ring of Honor. You know, they're going to be it's going to be more of an indie, you know, the, the hot indie guys. But it's impacts already have a hard time getting their hands on these indie guys. And I feel like it's going to be even more difficult for them. Yeah, I think, man, um, I think you're you're right that the 
one way or another, um, Tony Khan, uh, you know, trying to, you know, uh, reanimate Ring of Honor is going to, uh, is going to cause some headaches for Impact. And as you were talking, I was actually giving it a little more thought. And if there's one thing that we, I think, can glean from uh, AEW's interactions with Impact, or let's say Tony Khan's interactions with Impact, is that he doesn't have any respect for uh, Impact trying to do business. Like he doesn't, there, there's no reason for us to think based on what we've seen that Tony Khan is like, oh, well, I don't want to get in the way of Impact, you know, uh, <laughs> right. you know, making money or doing anything, right? We have no reason to think that he gives a damn about any of that. So um, that said, if he's looking for a night to put that show on, it's probably going to be Thursdays, right? Like he's, you know, he could, uh, he could do Tuesdays against NXT, but don't they have another YouTube show on Tuesdays? I think already. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Then Wednesdays is Dynamite. Thursdays is Impact. Friday is SmackDown. You're not messing with SmackDown. I'm sorry. You're not. You know, you're just not. You you could do Saturdays, but that seems less than likely. They already so, have Rampage on there, so. Oh right, and you got Rampage on Fridays. So yeah, I mean, like, if he's looking for a day to put a show on, he's probably going to put it on Thursdays. And I think that at least initially, I think at least initially, the uh, the ROH reboot is going to take a bite out of Impact's ratings. Um, but I don't think it'll last because I think Impact has been in a really good groove lately with the storytelling. Um, I think that in terms of like actually you know, putting on good fun shows. I think Impact is in a great groove right now. And I think that the uh, the novelty of of trying to re reboot ROH is going to wear off. Like you mentioned, like, okay, you take Cesaro, make him the main guy. And then like, you know, what are you going to do? Start rotating through old Ring of Honor guys. Going to, you know, bring back Jonathan Gresham, bring back Jay Lethal, bring back CM Punk, bring back Samoa Joe, bring back Brian Danielson. Like at, at some point, the novelty is going to wear off. And here's the thing. The, the, the AEW audience is already the I'm nostalgic about Ring of Honor audience. All those people who they love in AEW for the most part, they love them because they saw them get their start in ROH. Then they all migrated with them to New Japan. Then they migrated with them from New Japan to AEW, right? So like, you're already, you already got that audience. You're, the whole reason your audience is sympathetic to this whole idea of you buying Ring of Honor is because they're already the Ring of Honor audience. So why would they bounce back to Ring of Honor when you've basically created a new Ring of Honor? You're like, yo, I'm just going to create Ring of Honor with better production value, right? Bigger, better production value, bigger arenas. Like, that's all That's all AEW is. That's it is, is. yeah. That's yeah. 100% what AEW is. So, like, so why would they cycle back to old school Ring of Honor? Like, it doesn't make sense. And don't get me wrong. I guarantee you that at least initially, people will be curious. They'll take a look. But it's going to wear off, dog. It's going to wear off. Like, you can, you can only eat so much of the same thing. So I think that I think that it will, and, and like you said, also I think that Tony Khan, he can and will pay wrestlers more than Impact pays because, like you know, he he throws his money around. Like anybody who uh, has talked about Tony Khan has said he's very generous, which means he throws his money around. He's a rich guy, you know, it's his dad's money. He spends it freely. Like he has no problem with it. Like hey, hey whatever, it's your money. Do what you want. Um, like you know the funny thing. Everybody called Dixie Carter a money mark, right? But like, if she's a money mark, then what the hell is Tony Khan? To me, the <laughs> only difference between Tony Khan and Dixie Carter is that Tony Khan actually has the money to back up his his wild and crazy business moves. And you mentioned he is better at marketing. AEW is better at marketing than Impact or TNA has ever, ever, ever been. Got to give him credit on that. They capitalized on the marketing. Give them 100% credit for that. He knows his audience and he plays to his audience 100%. I totally give Tony Khan credit for that. Um, but that said, like I said, it just seems like a lot of recycling the same people to the same stuff. Like, again, we want to watch Young Bucks versus Red Dragon. We want to watch Adam Cole versus Adam Page. Like, why? They, they, again, they only care about this stuff because it happened in Ring of Honor a bunch of years ago. And now you're doing it again. And so now you want us to go back and watch Ring of Honor. And and if Ring of Honor is going to be some sort of AEW developmental territory, like, 
what's the point? You already have AEW Dark Elevation and you have AEW Dark. So now you're going to have a third developmental brand? What, make it make sense. How does that make any sense? It doesn't make sense. Tony Khan is a fan with a whole lot of money. And so as a fan with like, you know, think about, think about this. Us as fans of Impact, We've probably all at some point had the thought, man, if I had the money, I would hook Impact Wrestling up and we would, yeah, I, I'd make it look dope. You know what I mean? Like I, I'd do the production right. I'd pay the wrestling more. <laughs> yada, 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 yada. Yo, it's the same thing. Tony Khan is, he's, he's just like us, but he's a mark for Ring of Honor. You know what I mean? And he, and, and so because he's a mark for Ring of Honor and he has the bread to, to, to live out his mark fantasies, that's what he's doing. He like all the, Think about it, like all the dirt sheet rumors that that the, the internet trolls, you know, they always say things like, oh, the, uh, AEW should buy Ring of Honor or, or WWE yeah. should buy Ring of Honor. And I'm like, yo, what's the point? Like, I, I get it. They have a, um, a tape library of a lot of guys who have become big stars. But other than that, like, you know, the idea of like the actual Ring of Honor brand, as a brand in 2022, like it, to me, it just doesn't make sense. Like I said, the whole wrestling industry had a collective funeral for ring of honor late last year okay like we made our peace we said our goodbyes we gave our eulogies we gave ring of honor their flowers for the effect they've had on the way the wrestling business looks today but and, and that that should have been that man that should have been that they were given a proper send-off but because tony khan is just like us he's a mark he's a mark with money and so he couldn't let it go. He's sentimental. You know, he got sentimental and he decided he wanted to save Ring of Honor and not let it go away. You know, like, and, and, and to me, like I said, I, I just think it's a dumb idea. I think it's a dumb idea to buy Ring of Honor and try to, you know, uh, re-breathe life into it. It just, the brand is dead. Like, it, it, the bring, Ring of Honor was not selling out shows. You know, like, you... You can convince yourself that it's the fault of, you know, everybody else why Ring of Honor died. But at the end of the day, if they were still selling out shows, people buying tickets and buying merch and all that stuff, they'd still be doing shows today. OK, but people stop showing up to the shows and, you know, and it is what it is. So, look, we'll see how this plays out. But if you have to if you ask me which you did, I would say <laughs> eventually. I'd say initially it's going to be hot. People are going to be talking about it, but I think it's going to die out because again, it's just, it's like just recycling the same people for the same stuff and nostalgia, you know, nostalgia gets played out after a while. So I think that's, that's what it is. And to all of you, if you didn't see Tony Khan's announcement that he purchased ring of honor, it's effing hilarious. He is the most awkward. I, I see why he's not on screen now, why he doesn't, you know, it's one thing when he's, this guy's doing a press conference or whatever on screen with a microphone. He was the most awkward little beady eyed, you know, man, you could, you could imagine, dude, his, his voice was, I, I can't even do his voice. He sounded ridiculous, man. It wasn't even his normal speaking voice. I think he was trying to cut like a wrestling promo, <laughs> but it was, it was super awkward. And he, he, uh, he looked pretty ridiculous. He like he had some of that uh some of that Don Jr. going on. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, man. Oh, that was fucking <laughs> awful. <laughs> oh. The best is yet to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so y'all gotta check that out on YouTube. That that was embarrassing for him, man. But um <laughs> But that's it, man. We should uh we should get into this episode, which uh just spoiler alert, I didn't particularly care for the episode. I didn't think it was like complete crap. I just, I have my reasons. The good was good. Everything else was, I, I just didn't care for it. And, and, I, and, and I've been saying every episode this year has been really, really good. This just for me didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, I'm on a little bit of a different page here, man. Like I, 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 I thought that, I think they're, they're in a good groove right now. Um, one thing I didn't like is, the show felt a little bit dark and it looked like they had a pretty oh. good crowd at, uh, at, at the 2300 arena, you know, and the crowd sounded lively. I like that. 
So yeah. listen, I think it's, it's so important that we give Impact credit for doing things right, especially the stuff that we give them shit for. Uh, you know, w- when they fix it, we got to give them their flowers. And I I wish they would have lit this show better, right? Like lit the crowd yeah, better, so see the crowd better. But the crowd sounded lively. From all the pictures I saw, it was a good sized crowd. Um, I think it's just like, again, I think Impact needs to do more to just make the event feel more fun and lively. There's been a video circulating on social media of um of Naomi and Sasha Banks uh during like a commercial break at a WWE show, like dancing to like uh, a song by the weekend. And they're just like, they're just grooving, like you know what I mean? Like they're just dancing. <laughs> You know what I mean? And and people like record it and they're like circulating to me and like, oh my God, I love them. That looks like so much fun. But in between, you know, like commercial breaks or takes or whatever, I think Impact needs to just try to turn it into a party in there, man. They got to find a way just to get the energy up, like make it look like something people want to go to and have fun. The fact that they got such a good crowd in Philly tells me that people are seeing what I'm seeing, which is that, the shows have been good. The stories have been interesting. They just got to make it feel lively. Like, people got to feel like when your favorite hits the stage, cheer, yell, do whatever. You know what I mean? Like, people got to feel like when that person you don't like hits the stage, boo them out of the building. Don't let them get a word out. You know, like, that's the energy I want from Impact, you know? And and they got to find a way to cultivate that from the live audience. You know, I'm not sure how, do you think there's a way to, I think there's a way to do that. I don't know what the way is, but I think you gotta, you can't just get stuck in the motions of going out, executing your show every, every week, you know, or every two weeks, you gotta, you gotta have somebody consciously thinking about this crowd and how do we make sure we are getting the most out of this crowd? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I remember I went to uh years ago, I went to a Jay-Z concert and what and, and like he was in the middle of like you know he was, he was doing stuff and he's you know jay-z he's not like type of dude who jumps all over the stage like he's kind of stands there like yeah he stands like, there yeah you know like you know but but like <laughs> but, right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah but but like and, and one time he's like he's like he's, he's taking his jacket off he's like he's like yo sh- y'all I, 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 i'm gonna I'm get my do my thing like if y'all won't be too cool that's on y'all and it's like it's just just letting the crowd know like, yo, I'm doing my thing. This is me. Like, I don't jump around. That's not what I do, but I'm having fun. You know, like put the onus back on the crowd. Like y'all need to give us this energy, you know, like y'all need to, you know, make, make, make it live, man. Like, cause Josh Alexander is doing a phenomenal job. If you just, if you take crowd reaction out of it, because we are conditioned to measure what we see as effective or non-effective, based on the crowd reaction to people. But if you can just block out the crowd reaction or lack thereof, and just pay attention to what Josh Alexander is doing, he is killing it, dog. He is killing it. Like they ended the show last week with Moose showing up to his house with the contract. And this week, when you come out, like, I don't got nothing to say. I need to see you and I need to bust your head because what you did last week, and he came out and it's just straight fire. You know what I mean? Like fire in his eyes. Like if I see you, it's on, on site. And I'm like, yo, this is the energy. This is exactly what we need. He delivers it perfectly, right? And so they just got to get it to a point where the crowd sees him and feels him. And they are just like, you know, amping up this energy. You know what I mean? Like when Moose comes out, like everybody's just anticipating what's going to happen when they touch. So The story is there. They just have to find a way to produce that crowd up to to help, you know what I mean? Help help it along. Uh, When I I went to a lot of Impact Zone in Orlando tapings, uh, Jeremy Borash did a pretty good job of hyping the crowd up between, uh, you know, just in commercial. He was always talking to the crowd. He always uh, was, he was really good at that. And when I went to an AEW show, same thing, man. They've really kept the crowd going during the commercials. You know, if someone was in the ring cutting a promo and they were at a commercial, like he would just continue talk. He would just talk to the crowd for two minutes. Um, and then Justin Roberts did a pretty good job with it too, man. Um, and I, I was told with this set of tapings that 
they tried to do, you know, that uh, Penzer, you know, tried to get the people going. It wasn't working. So then, you know, they brought GM Miller out in between. And uh, I guess that was more of an improvement. But what, I, what I've been being told over these last several months that, you know, between matches, it's, it's we own the night over the speakers. I mean, shocker, right? It just it we own the night, um, you know, and, and that's about fucking it. And you're right. They got to you, you got to do something to get people going. And when I went to the NWA set of tapings about half a year ago, you know, they did a pretty poor job with that too. Like they, you know, between matches, it was, it was pretty dead. You know, they, they didn't have us getting excited or, or anything like that. So, you know, See, some, sometimes you gotta. I think, I think that like that right there is um, a great, it, like, like the proof is in the pudding, man. Like when I was, when I was in grad school and I had to do like projects where I would, you know, like I had this one project where we were shooting like a, a, a commercial, right? We were shooting a commercial and I was working with this, this lady who had done um, a ton of like professional like work doing shoots, like, you know, commercials and music videos and all types of stuff. And one thing she told me that always stuck in my head is the things that you, the, the details that you missed, that you miss in, in pre-production will show up in post-production. So like, little details like that right like again we said a long time ago impact seems to be satisfied with just putting on a good wrestling show and damn it they are putting on a good wrestling show that is undeniable like they are mm-hmm. putting on a good wrestling show i am enjoying it dog i'm enjoying a, a, a so much of this you know what i mean like like all, all the major stories to me right now are really fun they're really interesting they got wrestlers i want to see you know what i mean like Impact is in a good groove in so many ways right now, but they've got to find a way to make this feel fun. If you want people to come out of their house, go in their pockets, come to your shows and make it feel live so that more people want to come out, you know what I'm saying? So that you can get out of the uh, the the 1500 seat arena, or excuse me, get out of the 800 seat arena excuse me get out of the 400 seat arena and get into the 800 seat arena then get into the 1500 seat arena etc etc if you want that you have to make it feel fun make it like it's that should be such a priority and i and again like this is not knocking impact bro this is not knocking impact i'm just saying that this is like a clear thing like when you look at regardless of what I might think of AEW's product, the people at the show are having fun. They are into it, right? You went to an AEW show, right? I've never been to an AEW show, but from, from your experience at the AEW show, would you say the people were having fun? Yeah, absolutely. The people are very engaged with, you know, singing the, the songs. Um, you know, obviously you can hear it on TV, I don't think I I don't think Adam Cole wrestled, but I mean he's an example. The Adam Cole baby, like there's so yeah, much that the yeah, crowd yeah. is a part of, and you know I, I brought up NWA a second ago before the pandemic. There was a lot that the crowd was involved with with NWA too. They've got, yeah. they've lost that magic. That that company's lost it. But um, right. To go back to AW, the crowd is a part of the show. Yeah. And we don't we don't quite have that with Impact. And I've been saying that since before we even podcasts it together i always said hey man i'm watching these other shows that people are having a blast there yes and uh, they show the crowd a handful of times this episode one was they were you know they're clapping a couple are the same you know they want this to show the same five faces that that travel to each show and like hey we want you to know we have people who do this um i think it's getting a little old at this point you know, this is several years now of like, right, hey, we got to right. make sure this person, this person, this person get on screen. Um, yes. And then there was one, but there was one of a group. I took a screenshot of it sitting on their hands and they, the crowd and, and the, the, the camera showed them just sitting there, like trying to show it was while Josh Alexander was cutting his promo. Let's see what the crowd think of what he had to say. They pan to this group and they're just. You see one person clapping and everyone's just sitting on their fucking hands, dude. I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> what are you doing? Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, 100%. 100%. So, you know, listen, I think I think it's fair to say we've had uh, a little bit of success with getting to the ears of, of, of the people behind the scenes and impact. So this is going to be our mission for 2022 and going forward. Make impact fun. M-I-F. Make impact <laughs> fun. Okay? Make impact fun. Right? Like, yeah. Miffa, make impact fun again. <laughs> there we go. Yo, let's get some, let's get some hats printed up. Everybody, let us know if you would buy a Miffa hat. Um, for real though, man. Like, get like yo, man. Like, like the the pieces are in place. Like for the the story and all of that, man. But like again, AEW has like a cult where people are gonna come and they're gonna chant DMD. You know what's so funny about about that? By the way, I remember. During like the pandemic, I remember I, I tweeted one time and I swear I'm not taking credit for like for the crowd chat. I'm not doing that. But I'm saying that like I remember like tweeting at Britt, Britt Baker. I was saying like, man, I, I didn't I, I didn't like say like, hey, Britt Baker. But it was like I, I added her in the tweet. I was like, I, I said, like, I can't lie. I love chanting DMD when Britt Baker comes along, yeah, like along with the ring announcement, Britt Baker comes out and I swear, like, I feel like, I feel like ever since then, I've noticed so much more that, like, <laughs> it's that, that it's an emphasis, you know what I mean? Like, when they go, Dr. Britt Baker, dude. but like, but it, it got corny when, like, Tony Schiavone started doing it and everybody Very. started doing it. Like, it was corny. It was fun when, like, the ring announcer was saying it and then the crowd was saying it, you know, whatever. And even when, like, she was doing it. But when, Every single promo was she was lead up to, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it, it lost the steam for me. But, you know, anyway, the point is, right, there's several things that the crowd participates in and they feel like part of the show. Like, there's people who want to go to AEW shows, right, just so they can put, have that crowd participation. They love it. They want to chant along, you know what I mean? They want to curse at Dan Lambert and, you know, yell racial slurs at Brandy Rhodes. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They want to, yeah. It's the things you do when you go to AEW. So Impact needs some of that, you know what I mean? They and and al also, you know, every week on AEW, you see hilarious signs in the crowd. And, you know, same with WWE. But the way that Impact does their tapings, like, we don't see the crowd, so why would you – go out of your way to make a sign and, and try to do something fun with it. You know, exactly. they're not, we don't see them on the screen. So it's not, they don't have to go out, out of their way to look like they're having a blast. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm giving away you money right now. You, I, I would, I would start planting fans in, in the, in the stands with good sign, good, funny, clever signs. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like yeah. plant fans to like start chants. Like you could listen, like one of my great mentors in the television business told me life can be produced and it's true. Life can be produced. You have to, you have to lead things into being the way you want them to be. Right. Mm -hmm. If you want your kids to behave a certain way, you have to set that intention. Right. And you got to set the expectation of what happens when you follow my rules and what happens when you don't follow my rules. You know what I mean? Like, right, you, right. You, you, got, you know, life can be produced. Shout out to, uh, to, to my, my mentor, Kat. She was a she was a she was a real one. So I'm just saying, man, like, yes, well, I, I think I cut you off. But we were talking about like just the, you know, producing of the. Of the of the of the atmosphere yeah you know but it, it's just us if you're not going to be on screen if there's no no way you're going to be shown on tv like you know you, you're not going to be a you know make one of those obnoxious signs or you're not going to wear the merchandise you know you're not as likely to wear it i should say you know because right it, it's just kind of like they're already telling us if you go to every impact show, we're going to get you on TV. Other than that, you're not going to be on, on, on TV. So, you know, right. um, you mentioned the show looking dark. This was one of the reasons I didn't care for the episode. Mm. We've been talking about, you know, especially me, obviously, because I've, you know, been talking about post-production and, and color, uh, all this shit and editing. The show was looking really good for about a month. And this episode, they went right back to, a hundred percent to the right on the saturation slider. This show was so dark and they, 
they toned down the red in the background. You know, they usually have those bright red lights that piss me off. They were very subdued in tone. Like, they kind of were there. And I even noticed for about a month, the camera angle changed to where the screen wasn't... You couldn't see the screen with the floating impact logo, which I think is like a screensaver. Screensavers are distracting. So that's why I've always said, you know, I'd like to see a match graphic back there. They're not going to do that, obviously. But they subdued the red. But they, in in post-production, man, they went right back to 100%. And the show was so effing dark that, (laughs) you know... You know, I posted a screen. I, I took a picture, a screenshot. I posted on Twitter uh, just just a little while ago. All the shades of black where the referee uh, Eddie Edwards was in the ring for the what I took. His vest or whatever the hell he was wearing, the referee's clothes, mm-hmm. that the ring apron, everything was so fucking dark. It was all blended into each other. It looked like absolute fucking shit. And the I was just like, man, that's cool that they brought down the red but that did take some of the lighting away from the the ring. So the show was just dark, man. There was times where there was a uh, instance, Tasha Steeles was walking around at the side of the ring. I was like, I can't even see her. It was so dark. And then Eddie was wrestling outside the ring at one point. I was like, I can't, I can't see him. And now granted I'm watching on my phone, but I always watch it on my phone. And this, this stood out to me, this particular episode. So they went right back to, you know, overdoing it, and I thought the episode looked like crap, and I had a hard time watching it for that reason. Yeah. All right, so speaking of which, let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right, so the show opened. The Road to Rebellion goes through the legendary 2300 Arena in Philadelphia, All in and all new Impact Wrestling is on the air. Josh Alexander, hey guys, if you want to follow along, by the way, I'm reading straight from the Impact Wrestling recap on the website, so just in case you were wondering. Um, Josh Alexander addresses the actions of Moose. So after Impact World Champion Je- Moose confronted Josh Alexander's wife and child at their home in Canada. Woo, you got to die. I'm sorry. Uh, Alexander is in the ring to address <laughs> Moose's actions. Dog, can you imagine if somebody just showed up to your house? Like, why are you not home? Like, oh, my God. <laughs> I thought they could have done a little more with that, by the way. I thought they could have made it a little more. But see, I, I, I didn't think they, I didn't, I, I, I hear you, I hear you, but I didn't think they had to be dramatic with that. Like, um, think about this, right? You have neighbors, right? Like, I'm sure some of your neighbors you're more or less friendly with, right? So just think of a neighbor. No, who actually. You're, who, who you, no. <laughs> I hate they, my neighbors. <laughs> okay. Oh, perfect, but yeah, I perfect. get, I get where you're okay. so, so, so think of, think of one of the neighbors you don't like and imagine they like, you know, just not not even like nothing crazy but just barge their way into their house into your house like to and like was was talking a little crazy to your fiance could you imagine that bro like i that's like when i that's what i saw this i was like dog this has to hit home for every man you know what i'm saying like you every man has to watch this and be like oh josh you gotta fuck this dude up you got yeah to. you got you know what i mean so like um but but that but by the way that's dope that's, that's dope television. That's what wrestling is supposed to do. You're supposed to find a nerve that hits with your audience. You know what I mean? That we can relate to. So now we can all understand, right? Like every, every man, like your charge in life is to protect your wife and kids. You know what I mean? Like, like if, if nothing else, with your own life, if need be. You know what I'm saying? So the idea that, that one of your enemies is in your house is, is stepping foot over the threshold of your house, intimidating your wife? Oh my God. So we should all be feeling Josh Alexander at this moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, all right, back to it. So, uh, so Josh Alexander, he's in the ring to address Moose's actions and he's furious, saying that there is no going back from what he did. Alexander states that Moose has pushed him over the edge and he's going to make him feel pain in their Impact World title match at Rebellion. Alexander calls out Moose and the Impact World champion appears at the top of the ramp. Moose vows to take another trip to Alexander's home after he beats him at Rebellion. Alexander charges towards Moose and a wild brawl breaks out between the two rivals. The fight spills to the back where Alexander attempts to throw Moose off a balcony. Madman Fulton pulls him off as other top, as other impact members of the locker room break things up. 
Of course, Scott Demore tries to calm Josh Alexander down. By the way, Josh Alexander looks like he's about two seconds from choking the shit out of Scott Demore. Um, yeah. And Alexander says that his emotions will be in check as long as Moose stays away from his family. So, again, I know we basically already said this, but, like, I, I've been saying that I think Josh Alexander shouldn't win the title at Rebellion. And the reason why I've been saying that is because I just thought that the feud needs more time to heat up. I'm good. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Like, Moose needs his ass fully whooped for what he did. You know what I mean? And, like, so I'm invested. And Josh Alexander, he's on the hero's journey. Like, for the, <clears throat> the way Moose snuck him to get the title was one thing. But, again coming into his home like that makes it personal and like you just you you you, you violate it you violate it so now you got to get violated so yeah the, the way that they're setting up this <laughs> i mean uh we talk about feuds and matches being set up by bumping each other backstage i mean uh mad Matt fulton shows up to break up the fall mm-hmm. of a sudden he's got a you know and man i knew josh was gonna not josh but scott Demore. i knew within the first Five minutes of the show, this motherfucker was going to be on the screen with his Josh, Josh. I, I just knew it. Um, but that being said, <clears throat> excuse me, they've done a really excellent job actually of making this feud interesting. And it's, um, it's a far cry from Josh versus Christian Cage, which when that was happening at Bound for Glory, I had said a few times on the podcast, I was like, dude, is this the best that they got to make this? feud interesting they they started obviously it was a long-term story but they they started saying josh you know you got to control your emotions and at the time josh wasn't doing nothing but cutting some promos like usually josh had no he lacked a lot of charisma early in his impact run and into that baby face run and um I, I was like, why do they keep bringing up he has to keep his emotions in check, dude? Like, this guy isn't, you know, losing his mind or anything. It wasn't until the moose thing happened, all of a sudden he started kind of snapping. But the Christian Cage and Josh Alexander feud was just cutting promos week and week, one, one or week to week. One week they're talking to Gia, and then they're in the ring, and then they're both in a room together. It was so fucking boring, man. I was like, this is the best that they got? Uh, you know, I, I just thought it sucked. And uh, this is a far cry from that. And I, I think with Josh, you have to have some kind of storyline. I still think he's a little boring. I think p- some people probably enjoy what he's doing a little bit more than I do. But my point is, I do think he has to be in storylines that have to be There has to be emotion involved. There has to be stakes. There has to be a story. I just said a story that has to have a story. I just mean there has to be some kind of engaging story. The best stories do have a story. Yeah, yeah. I just mean he has to be involved in in an engaging story. I don't think he can just be, I'm Josh Alexander, the badass badass wrestler, and we're going to have a feud based on that. I just don't, I think we're so far past that, and I don't think it'll work going forward if that's what they try to do. Um, you know, so th- this is this is pretty good stuff that they're you know that they're doing here. They're making it you know this match matter and mean something. Totally agree. Totally agree. And like yeah, man. I, and again, I think that um, you know that that has to be on impact as far as like making sure that you find ways to make sure everybody feels this intent this intensity. Like listen, like like I said, it's it's hitting with me. But just like I think you and me are a good reflection of um a good sample size of like a, a, a lot of the audience how like for me i'm like i'm all in like yo what moose did like you foul you got to get it after this and some people were still like you know i need to see a little more josh you know what i'm saying and i think that like so again if you are the producer right like you you got to you, you can't just leave you can't leave anybody feeling like they need to see more by the time we get to rebellion everybody needs to feel that josh alexander needs to get his redemption you know what i mean if it wasn't for the the way he got got bound for glory then definitely for this or for something else you know what i mean so everybody just got to keep building like whatever it is that people need to see to make them feel Josh Alexander on his hero's journey a little more, they got to make sure they give it to us. Cause it, listen, rebellion will be here before you know it, man. Like 
the 23rd, that's, that's not that far away. That's like a month away. What I Four thought weeks. was actually really bad editing was after that whole segment with Josh where, you know, he almost threw Moose, almost threw him to his death pretty much. No, but, I mean, he tried to throw him over the edge. It was emotion. It was yelling. It was screaming. It was this and this and this. And then they, instead of just letting us live in the moment and cutting to a commercial, they cut, they, they immediately go from that to Tom and, and, and Matt talking over wheel in the night with, with the crowd <laughs> cheering in the background. <sighs> and I was just like, man, like that's, that's how you come back from the commercial. Like you can't have that kind of segment and you, you have to go off the, not the, off the air, but you, you got to go into a break with that. You can't, yeah, you can't yeah, cut out to these guys hyping you up for the rest of the broadcast, man. Right. You know, right, I just thought right. that was bad editing there, but what the fuck do I know? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck do you know? You're just a guy with a podcast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. So we have Willie Mack versus Laredo Kid versus Mike Bailey in a Rebellion X Division title match qualifier. The winner of this match will join X Division champion Trey Miguel and Ace Austin in a triple threat X Division title match at Rebellion. Because why would you ever have an X Division title match with just two people? Why would you? Yeah. Do that? Uh, the action is fast and furious from the opening bell as all three competitors exchange Hurricane Ranas. Mac soars through the air, taking out everyone on the floor. Bailey delivers a flurry of kicks to Mac, followed by a flip dive to the outside. Kid hits the jaw dropping springboard corkscrew. Kid connects with a twisting superplex and a top rope frog splash to Bailey. Mac catches Bailey with a Samoan drop, followed by a signature standing moonsault. Mac pays homage to Scott Hall with a razor's edge to Kid. By the way, I thought he should have won with that. Just give it the circumstances. He should have won with that damn move, dog. He should have. All right, Bailey hits the Ultima weapon on Mac to advance to Rebellion. Yo, so Mike Bailey's move is like a, it's, it's like a double knee drop. Wait, it's a moonsault with a double knee drop with the other person, with the his opponent on all fours. That feels so dangerous. Like, isn't that basically the yeah. same way Rich Swan broke his leg? Something like that? Man, it's I know. I, similar to that. I, I don't remember exactly what happened there with Swan. I remember the exact match. I just don't remember how how he came yeah, down. It, it was something like that. It was like it was like he was like uh like hunched over and uh whoever they were whoever they were wrestling like jumped off the top and gave him like the double foot stomp to the back. And I don't know, maybe they stomped on his leg by mistake, but you know, he ended up breaking the leg. Like it just it it seems a little seems a little unnecessarily dangerous. I don't know. Yeah, but speedball Mike Bailey, his offense is dope, man. I love, I love his stuff. Yeah, that move just it, it makes me worry after what happened to Rich Swan. Um, so this match, right? It, it, as I'm just reading this, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, Impact tries to tape a lot of TV at once, right? Like, instead of do, you need the qualifier because the qualifier directly leads to the title match, but again. If you just take the time and just shine up each of these competitors, then we mm -hmm. would care a lot more when we get the qualifier. Like, yeah. let me see Willie Mack beat some people. You know what I mean? Let me see Mike Bailey beat some people. Let me see Laredo Kid beat some people. Let me get used to their offense and their moves and whatever so that when they all get together, it feels like a big deal. You know? It seems like all, it seems like every match is like a qualifier or an eliminator, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> shine them up so we can actually care right um you know in these two matches laredo kid john schuyler crazy steve when is the last time we've seen one of them win a show on tv or win a show period for a couple of them i mean win a match period not a show willie mack got that win over uh kenny king recently but other than that when when has he fucking won a match dude like I'm not going to lie. I didn't care about this match and I should have enjoyed it. But when they released a graphic of Trey McGill and two silhouettes and people were like, I think it's going to be Jake something and Laredo kid and shit. I was like, dude, you know, people were just guessing. I said, I already know. And they didn't even announce the matches. I already know it's Ace Austin and, and Mike Bailey in this match. Like, so just fucking book the match, dude. Yeah. It's, I, <sighs> I like when wins and losses dictate a story, not when the story dictates who wins and lo loses matches. You know, 
I, I want to see just some good matches. Someone gets on a hot streak. Someone gets on a cold streak. And, and all of a sudden, and paths cross, and organically, you create a feud. Not, okay, they've been creating this Mike Bailey and Ace Austin storyline. They're the only six, only people of the six in these matches and Trey Miguel who are in, involved in any kind of storyline. You could argue Willie Mack is a little bit, but of course these two were going to win. They didn't, they didn't present it in any other way that the, any of these guys had a chance to win. So I would have preferred these guys just won the matches, and then you start building the story of like, hey, let's, let's be friends, shit like that. Like That just yeah. would have been more fun for me. Um, but again, I just like when wins, wins and losses dictate the stories, not when the story dictates who wins and loses. Like, it's kind of like a, sport, you know, a sporting event. And let's just take basketball, for instance. Sometimes there's a – right now there's a rivalry, Trey Young versus the Knicks. And it happened because Trey Young destroyed them in the playoffs in New York. And then just last week he destroyed them in New York again. And now you have an organic build. There was, the NBA wasn't like, yo, we want Trey Young and the Knicks to have a rivalry. So, Trey, we're going to need you to play really good every time you go there. And we're going to need the Knicks to play like shit. Right. And, you know, like, just let who wins and who lasts, who loses the matches kind of dictate. That way it's just like – it's organic. It feels organic, but this is just, it was just so freaking obvious. Not even Trey Miguel's in a freaking storyline. He's an afterthought in all this, which is wild. So I really didn't right. care, man. I right. did not care. I barely watched this match, dude. I just kind of had it as background noise and I should have enjoyed this. I should have sat and yo, these th- three really good guys. Like I should have just enjoyed it. And I did, I just, I couldn't fucking care less, man. I was like, I just, Mike Bailey's going to win. Let's just get to this. And then, you know, get to rebellion. But, you know, unfortunately, I just, I, I didn't care. Hell yeah. No. <clears throat> well, every time these people come on, on screen, I'm reminded of, you know, what you said about just knowing ahead of time where the triple threat was going. So, you know, you're right, though. You're right. You're right. And it played out exactly how you said it would. So when, when was the last, th- when was the last time I was t- telling this to my girl today, we were watching, um, AEW and Dax Harwood was wrestling CM Punk and there was a couple botched spots where where it was an obvious three count and the ref had to hold his arm down so that CM Punk wouldn't yeah. lose you know uh-huh. and um, <laughs> I was telling her I said man I don't remember the last time in wrestling there was a legitimate upset where someone just beat a top dude or or, or you were watching a match and you just didn't know who was gonna win you know, and I don't mean like two X division baby faces going at it. I, you know, oh, we don't know if Trey or Jake something's gonna win. I, I don't mean it like that, but I mean a match with like real stakes or or a guy, or or one of them's a top dude. You know, like when was the last time we just had like a legitimate upset? You know, they still talk to this day about one two three kid beating Razor Ramon. You know, I remember watching that. Like holy shit, you know. Um, it's because we just right, though, like it, it speaks to the rarity of like a, a true surprise, a true upset. Right, right. And they just, we don't have that in wrestling anymore now, man. We always know who's going to win. We have a good mm-hmm. idea who's going to win. And if the, the underdog does win the match, it's because they either cheated or they, they present it as some kind of fluke victory. Right. Oh, the ref didn't mm-hmm. see the foot on the rope or, or something like that. Watching this match, dude. What if Dax Harwood did fucking pull one out versus CM Punk somehow, dude? Like, this would have elevated him to a completely different level, you know? And CM yeah, Punk, yeah. He, can, he, dude, he can't lose sometimes. Like, he's not going to – it's not going to hurt his spot on the card. It doesn't mean he got buried, you know? Like, I don't know. I just can't really think in any promotion of a match that was a, a legitimate upset, legitimate surprise win where you're just like, holy – up in crap you know so yeah it's it's few and far between like i remember like two years ago or three years ago i think they had a private party beat the young bucks like early on to yeah like, true start their aw tag but but think about that that's just so long ago right like you're right it happens so rarely it's very rare uh a couple of weeks ago on monday night raw uh the street profits beat randy orton and matt riddle but it turns out that was actually like a botch like uh <laughs> Randy Orton, somebody did a frog splash on Randy Orton off the top rope and knocked the wind out of him, so he couldn't kick out. <laughs> oh my god, I gotta look that up on YouTube. 
which is like it's funny because like um in that situation right like the ref the ref must have just been told just count the three like just the, the, the so i guess in some situations the ref the ref is told to play it straight up you know what i yeah. mean like the the which is which i think is cool because that you leave the emphasis on the performers to do what they're supposed to do so you know it, and and that leaves like the potential for a moment like that which is crazy you know what i mean because you if, if you find the um if you find the video of the match you can see immediately after the three count you can see everybody get in the ring and kind of start like like talking to each other like oh, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to do this next what the fuck? um but yeah but so um but yeah like but it, but it rarely happens right like you rarely get like a true you know surprise upset this doesn't really happen yeah all right so the Bullet Club vowed to right their wrongs tonight. Bullet Club looks to reclaim the Impact World Tag Team titles from Violent, Violent by Design. Next week, Jay White and Chris Bay face off against the Motor City Machine Guns in a rematch following the controversial finish to their last meeting. Raj Singh says that Bupinder Gujar lost his chance to fight by his side, so instead he recruited the returning Shira. The Indian Lion was victorious over Crazy Steve earlier tonight on BTI. So Shira has returned to Impact for the 11th time. And, <laughs> whew, I am excited. Um, up next, we had Steve Macklin versus Heath with Rhino. Um, no reason to really go. He's also this. the OVW champion, by the way, Shira. Is he? He just beat oh. Jesse Goddard, who had the title for over a year. Oh, wow. All right. Cool. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um... So Macklin beat uh, beat Heath, uh, duh. And after the match, yeah. Rhino jumps in and gives Macklin a gore. Cool. All right. Uh, Tanil Dashwood. So let me, let me talk on this real quick. Oh, go ahead. So Matt Raywall says during this, like, oh, you know, Macklin beat him with the spear last week. That's the most disrespectful thing you can do is beat someone with their own finisher. You know what would have made that statement hold so much more weight? As if four people on the roster didn't have spear finishers, including right. your world champion. So don't be talking about disrespected Rhino. What about disrespecting your world champion and protecting his finisher by not having half the fucking roster do it? And <laughs> when Macklin won with that gore last week, what did Bupinder do in the next match after that? Win with the fucking spear. The, yeah. <laughs> the, the match right after it. I'm just like, bro it's i i i i like bupinder's uh second rope spear i think it's an interesting setup right like because sometimes like when i when i see a, a move i i need some sort of realism in terms of like you know like you love one of the best things about like uh, a diamond cutter slash rko is the whole out of nowhere thing right like ddp used to put that thing on somebody would be getting them for a suplex and he had dropped behind their back wham diamond cutter you know like same thing rko like you turn your head wham rko out of nowhere like the 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 realisticness that you could just get that move on out of nowhere like a scenario in which the move can be applied it has to either be that or like a dominant straight up setup into the move like it can't be a clunky a clunky, you know, finish that's supposed to be like thrilling and exciting and surprising because a move like that, like a, a, a spear off the middle ropes, like, I don't know, you're better off just setting that up with like, you know, a, a, a nice, I'm beating you down, whatever, five moves of doom, like John Cena, whatever. And this is what's coming. Like, I'd rather go like that than trying to do something crazy like, oh, uh, superplex, but he's still on the ropes. And, you know, uh, the guy's groggy now, you know, middle rope spear. It's like, nah, man, just like, you know, come on. It, I mean, the move looks cool, but it has to be, I think it needs to be set up properly. Right, right. No, and I, and I feel that. I just, I don't know. I think he's probably the newest guy on the roster, if not, one, you know, one of the top two or three. I just feel like when they had that conversation one day, oh, what's your finish? It's Oh, it's the spear from the second rope. No one was just like, hey, dude, we have three people who, who actually win with the spear, including the champion. So you got anything else you could use? I, I, it's just weird to me, man. I, I can't believe how many people share finishers in this company. Right. So. 
whatever. I could talk about that all day. I feel like I talk about it every episode, but it just pisses me off when I see it. You're not wrong. You know, you're not wrong. It's definitely a thing. All right. So let's see what we have after that, after the match, Rhino, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So this segment I like, okay. So uh, to to Neil Dashwood's talk show, all about me is back (laughs) with Caleb with a K. He interviews one half of the knockouts world tag team champions. Dashwood questions where Caleb's loyalties lie, whether it's him, whether, whether it's with the influence or the inspiration, Caleb dodges the question, but runs right onto the set of Madison Rain's talk show, <laughs> Locker Room Talk. So I, I love that, right? Like he's, you know, he's like trying to talk his way out of it. He runs away and then he looks up and it's like, oh, it's Madison Rain. And here's Locker Room Talk. And he's like, you know, runs into the other talk show. I thought that was like really funny. And uh, let's see what happens. I thought it was it funny Madison. too, man. I, I felt like this, the episode, everything that was not in the ring, everything outside of the ring was good or it was funny. And then everything in the ring for me was just, uh. yeah. Um, another outside the, the ring segment that was really good was Jonah's promo. He cut a promo walking down the street saying he's going to battle uh, Tomohiro Ishii for the first time ever at Rebellion. Now, I, I have no attachment to Ishii, but like, but Jonah has been killing it, dog. Like, I, I don't know what Jonah's contract status is, but in my view, he's put himself in line for a world title shot and it's tough because josh alexander seems like he should be getting a title shot you know what i would do you know what i would do because i i mentioned how much it would be cool if we're still building this josh alexander uh feud all the way to like bound for glory or maybe slam or whatever <clears throat> if we do if they do something like jonah beats ishii at Rebellion and declares himself the number one contender. And then maybe Jonah costs Josh Alexander his match against Moose. And so, uh, and then we we do something where Slammiversary is like a triple threat between Jonah and Moose and Alexander. And then Bound for Glory, we get Moose Alexander once and for all. And, you know, something like that. But I feel like Jonah is killing people and he's, he's dope. And yeah, so I feel like you got to give Jonah a title shot, man. He looks like he should be in the world title picture. Yeah, I said this a few weeks ago. He's done every, everything that he's done this far. The next progression is a title shot, but there's nothing for him to wrestle for. That's right. So now they're like, hey, they're going to give him the Josh Alexander treatment of like, hey, we're just going to give you good opponents to wrestle from outside the company. You know, like he. You can't say Impact doesn't have a good lack of top heels at the moment because they do. There's there's no room. And your top champion's a heel. I mean, your champion is a heel. So there's just nothing for a guy like Jonah to do than, other than to have good matches with people. Right. You know? right. Um, yeah. So, But they got to figure it out, man. They got to figure it out. Because somebody like that, again, you got to feature him prominently. We don't know how long they have him. But, I mean, this is an example of a talent that jumps off the screen. You know what I mean? Like, like there's something special about him yes. as much as I say, like Josh Alexander, you know, he has all the goods, but they need to produce it up a little more to make him feel a little more special. Not with Jonah, man. Not with Jonah. Like I see it. It's there. It's, it's there. He's, he's the goods. Whatever they taught him in NXT, man, you know, before they went to this 2.0 thing. So uh, by the way, this is totally off topic. I, I watch, I try to watch 2.0. The first couple episodes, I was like, dude, this is really good. And now I'm like, this is really bad. Yeah. And, uh, man, it was Brian Lass. I was listening to, you know, uh, Jim Cornette. He hit it on the nose, man. He goes, NXT 2.0 is like watching Glow. It's a, a parody of wrestling. You know, they're well, talking so, about the girl so, who sleeps in the ring and with the pajamas yeah. and the, the fake talk show. I, I, I never, I never watch a full episode. There's like, a, so I like, I, I skim NXT 2.0 for a couple of things. Uh, Carmelo Hayes, Gigi Dolan, <laughs> and uh, Nikita Lyons. And <laughs> that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. I just skim through. Like, I don't sit there and watch 
NXT 2.0 because you look, look, it's people practicing and preparing to come up to the main roster. But dog, Carmelo Hayes, buy, buy the stock, buy the stock, dog. Yeah. Car- um, were you watching WWF in like early 90s? I want to say I started taking a break around that time when it was starting okay. to get like the new era when it was like getting when it was like really, really bad. Do you remember when Shawn Michaels first broke away from Marty Jannetty and he was like, you know, he had sensational Sherry yeah. and he was just putting in bust ass matches and then he won the Intercontinental title from British Bulldog and it was like, yo, this dude is the man. It's like, I it's like I know he's not the champion, but this dude is the man. Yeah, yeah, that's, I remember. That's Carmelo Hayes, dog. That's what they're doing with Carmelo Hayes. And by the way, it's probably not a coincidence at all because Shawn Michaels is basically doing what Triple H was doing in NXT now. So if Shawn Michaels is booking NXT, it would make sense that he's presenting an, an undercard guy who's who's uh, prepping to be a top guy, much like he was early in his career. I'm, bro, I'm telling you, Carmelo Hayes, I'm buying the <laughs> stock, bro. I'm buying the stock. Like he, he seems like he is going to be like, like, like franchise player. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, but, but that's kind of what NXT is right now. It, it's like, which by the way, I think that's exactly what it should be. Like the, 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 the black and gold, you know, the, the, all right. So look, here's what it all breaks down to, right? Freaking ring of honor. It breaks down the ring of honor. People wanted a WWE version of ring of honor. Triple H said, I'm going to make a WWE version of ring of honor. They did it. Then again, AEW comes out and they're like, well, we're doing Ring of Honor with the Ring of Honor people. And, yeah. you know, it was what it was. And then Vince was like, but also what happened was, if, if you remember, right, like there's a, there's a, there's like a gap between like that 2014, 2015 NXT when they were doing exactly what they're doing right now, which is uh-huh. specifically molding people to go onto the main roster it went off the rails in my opinion in 2016 2017 uh, up to now when they decided they wanted to be a, a ring of honor you know what i'm saying when they decided we wanted to be tomasho champa and got johnny gargano and adam cole you know what i mean when they decided that's what they wanted to be again all the ring of honor fans loved it but they weren't sending people up to the main roster they were no longer supplying uh people that the main roster could use and that's why vince had to kill it he had to it was like if if you're not gonna if you're not gonna ward off AEW, if you're not gonna be useful in that in that case and you're not also not supplying me with stars i could use like he was never gonna use adam cole you know what i mean like in what world is vincent kennedy mcmahon Gonna have Adam Cole beating people up on Monday Night Raw. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's not a knock on Adam Cole, by the way. I'm just saying that, like, you know, there's, 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 there's fits, right? There's, there's like, there's certain, there's certain scheme fits, right? Like, if you again, if you're casting for the role of Shawn Michaels, I'm not in. I'm not getting. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not auditioning for the role of Shawn Michaels in his biopic, okay? Because I'm not going to get it. I don't fit the role, okay? Like, so same thing, right? Like, Adam Cole doesn't fit a, a Vince McMahon top guy. You know what I mean? He just doesn't. So, you know, we got way off track. Yeah. Uh, I know people don't like that. I know, I know people don't like when you get off track, but. Oh, my God. Also, I I was, uh, I don't know if you saw on, on, on Twitter this week, like, I dropped a comment. I was like, oh, yeah, the, the best impact pod is, uh, is the cool factor uh, with BQ and T- TW. I love those guys. And somebody was like, no it's too negative (laughs) (laughs) okay whatever you say yeah some people don't get it man yeah whatever anyway uh so the impact locker room surrounded the ring as violent by design defended their impact world tag team titles against the good brothers in a lumberjack match gallows and anderson i'm not gonna read this play by play um so what happened was what happened was during dove out did a did a dive into all the sea of humanity on the outside and while the referee was distracted mike bennett delivered a low blow to carl anderson uh followed by the climax from matt taven 
and Eric Young crawled over to get the cover and the victory. So we're now it's going to be some um, some uh, some good brothers, some Bullet Club versus some Honor No More, and uh, I like that. I like that. We got a little heel on heel violence. I'm here for it. I didn't understand why this was a lumberjack match to keep Diener out Just of the ring setup. because they they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't uh, justify they couldn't that eight. Of, right? No, no, they they could they couldn't think of any other way to get like Taven and uh, and 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 Bennett involved there. Yeah, fair enough. Because like they weren't going to try to come out like they don't have any reason to have like. Uh, violent by designs back so they weren't going to just come out and do that and they're probably going to be the ones who win the eight the eight tag team clusterfuck you know what i mean so yeah they uh, have to right so they they didn't want to probably change the titles too many times too soon i mean i feel like the lumberjacks were the teams who are probably going to be in this eight team shit show that they're going to do at the pay-per-view but the arena was so dark, man. I didn't know who the hell was at ringside barely, you know? I, I just feel like they could have done something to let us know who was at ringside so we can at least start getting invested to who might be in this match. Right. You know, but this wasn't a traditional lumberjack match where in the first – usually when you have a lumberjack match, you give it three to four minutes and someone goes outside the ring and everyone tosses them back in. Like, they were just standing watching the match for 90% of it until the very end where Joe Doring got about six inches of air off the ground and took, <laughs> took all these guys out. Yo, when I saw that, I was like, dude, why does everybody have to die? Why? Why? Yeah. Clearly he was not comfortable doing that. And that's not his game. So why, why does he have to do that? You know, like it, it added nothing. It didn't look good. There was no point in him doing that. None. Yeah. But I, I didn't – this match is okay, though. It's, again, I just – I know the cool factor is so fucking negative. Uh, you know, even though we've been – I've done nothing but positive shows in 2022, but, again, I just didn't care for this episode. I'm not saying anything bad about the show in general. I've been saying it's really good. This was just another match I kind of didn't care about. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but, again, listen, that's on them – to make us care about the match, right? Like, yeah. I, I was, I was, I was having this conversation in a in a Twitter Spaces with some people the other night. We were talking about, um, I'm in a really fun Twitter Spaces group uh, called uh, Turnbuckle Talk. Um, they usually do them on, I think, Tuesdays and Fridays, and it's it's mostly WWE and AEW conversation. Not a lot of Impact fans up in there, but a lot of people, and this is why I kind of enjoy that group, is like a lot of people have like this just super optimism over like everything they see on like WWE TV. And like, yeah. I, 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 I'm often the parade pisser of the group, you know what I mean? Ah. But I'm like, but I'm like, dog, you, so for example, right? Like WrestleMania is coming up pretty soon. And like, in my opinion, the build has been pretty lackluster. Like I'm not excited about Brock versus Roman for the, 470th time like you know they're unifying the titles but but i but i know enough about uh about television networks to know it. and i also i just don't think that there's any realistic way that they're going to keep those titles unified for any amount of time right like it, it, a, a month or two max right so this is your big stipulation is a title unification. And I don't even really see it as like a real title unification because I just don't think they're going to stick with that for any amount of time. And like, other than that, right? Like, I don't know what else there is to be excited about. There's, um, I'm excited about the Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch match, but I feel like they're not even giving that the shine it deserves. And they're really pushing a Ronda Rousey and Charlotte Flair match. They're going to do something where Stone Cold comes out and beats up Kevin Owens and like, it's just there's not a whole lot i'm gonna watch it you know what i mean but i'm not i'm just i'm not excited about it right and so i was you know saying this to people and i'm like look dog it's not my job to be excited about what wwe is doing it's their job to get me excited about what they're doing and i, I say the same thing about impact like as fans again if you want it to be better you have to question it you have to hold it accountable. 
Like, don't just brush it off. Don't just say, oh, that's their style having oversaturated color. Like, no, be like, yo, I can't see the damn show. Call it yeah. out. You know what I mean? Like, that's how you get it fixed. You know, that's how you get it fixed. So, yeah, man, like, that's just, that's just, that's, listen, if you want to just keep taking whatever crap people give to you, that's on you, man. But like, we would rather have a nice, fun, you know, like smart discussion at a TV show that we like. And if you can't handle that, then like, you know, shit, listen to something else. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Um, all right. So, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Gia Miller interviews Knockouts World Champion Tasha Stills ahead of the Knockouts World title defense against Mickey James in a street fight tonight. Mickey wants there to be no interference in the match. And shockingly, Tasha agrees to leave Savannah Evans in the back. All right, so then we had Eddie Edwards versus Rocky Romero. I could not have cared less about this. Um, I'll, I'll say I thought the match was cool. I thought it was fun, but yeah, was I agree. I'd never. I, I don't think I've ever seen Rocky Romero win a match, dude. So I don't know why, why Rocky Romero is here. Like it's just again, this, this is another one of those things where they just expect that the audience has certain prerequisites as far as like they they have a working knowledge of who Rocky Romero is. And so they should be excited when they see him, you know, and I, I just, I don't. So he's just there and losing. And so it's like, okay, yeah. Cool. But, the, but the match was fine. And they worked Jonathan Gresham in there. Um, Eddie Edwards defeated him. And after the bell, Eddie Edwards offered his hand to Rocky Romero. Um, but then, you know, Rocky Romero, tried to shake his hand and Eddie Edwards just kept, you know, whooping on him. And then Jonathan Gresham came out to uh, break it up. And he, you know, he fought Eddie Edwards and Eddie Edwards ran out of the ring. And then Jonathan Gresham and Rocky Romero shook hands. All right. Uh, backstage, we see Zicky Dice enjoying his studies at Swinger's Dungeon. <laughs> Next week, Swinger needs to ele elevate, evaluate him one-on-one -on -one in the first ever chump chump challenge <laughs> oh that's good All i've, right, so I've this... said this i've said this a few times when they when swinger first came on screen i was like i fucking hate this and uh as it per, as it's progressively he's as, as he's progressive progressively been on tv over the last couple of years i'm starting to find him hilarious yeah. so <laughs> it, it's like this sex dungeon thing but swinger has no clue like <laughs> it's so ridiculous man but it, it's funny <laughs> um all right so now it's time for our main event you ready so we had tasha stills versus mickey james in a street fight Yay. for the knockouts world championship it's a personal rivalry between knockouts world champion tasha stills and mickey james explodes in a street fight with the title on with the title on the line mickey Throws a trash can lid at Tasha Stills while she's making her entrance. They brawl on the outside where Mickey hits a neck breaker on the exposed ramp. Out of nowhere, Savannah Evans clobbers Mickey from behind, despite Tasha saying that she didn't need help from uh, Savannah tonight. Then Tasha places a trash can over the head of Mickey and smashes her with a baseball bat. A steel chain is wrapped around the neck of both knockouts as Tasha sends her crashing into uh crashing into a chair so there was a lot here they beat each other up with chains and the whole yada 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 this was a good match this was definitely worth watching but let's get to the good stuff yeah. so savannah evans is in the ring they're getting ready to do a beat down on mickey james when chelsea green comes running down with the chair chelsea green slides in with the chair and we've seen this a hundred times right the baby face uh, the, the, the person is there to, we think to help the baby face, they hold the chair, they act like they're going to hit the heels and then they switch and start hitting the baby face. So Chelsea green slides in, she has the chair and we think she's going to do the same thing. Cause we've been, we all know she's going to turn on Mickey eventually, but instead she opens the chair, sits down and watches the beat down continue. And I couldn't help, but just watch this and think to myself, when did Chelsea green get all that thigh meat? Anyway, so she I was good, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so she just sat there and watched as uh, Tasha Stills and Savannah Evans beat down Mickey James. Tasha Stills beat her with a frog splash for the win. By the way, can I tell you something that I noticed? I've been, I, I came across some clips of Eddie Guerrero lately, and I noticed that remember when 
we were having a conversation about uh what's the proper way to land in like a moonsault or whatever yeah yeah it's so like i noticed that when eddie guerrero does his frog splash he does it so that he jackknifes in and then comes out and as he's coming down he slaps the mat why does that matter because you see so many people when they do splashes off the top rope, they hurt themselves and knock the wind out of themselves and they like roll over grabbing their ribs. And you never saw Eddie Guerrero do that, I feel like. And yeah. the reason why is because he did it with that form with the frog splash so that his all the impact was going onto the mat and not the person. It's the little things. It's the little things. Yeah, man. It- it- that move clearly is an art because Tasha Steele's frog splash looks like ass, man. It's not. Uh, but it, and someone um, had told me the other day she needs to stop doing that move. I was like, yo, as long as they let Mickey James do that botching ass DDT, <laughs> Tasha Steele's gonna do the frog splash. I promise you that. Right. Exactly. Uh, it, did, it didn't look good. Uh, yeah. No. She. She. He got. She got to tighten it up. Definitely. Watch some clips of Eddie and see how he does that. And um, but it, but it was just it was cool to see, right? Because we see so many people like basically butcher that move. You know what I mean? Like well, again, when if you get a chance, pull up some clips of Eddie Guerrero doing that frog splash, and you'll start noticing what I just told you. And you'll see that like he does it in a way where he's not hurting himself or the other person, right? Which is again the art of wrestling, right? Mm-hmm. So all right, so that was the 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 big swerve. Mickey just watched. Uh, watched the the hills beat. Excuse me, Chelsea. Chelsea watched Mickey get beat down by the hills, and they go away with the title. And the, here's where I love Mickey James. So after after the match, Chelsea's sitting there in the, in the chair, and she's berating Mickey. Oh, you thought you didn't need me? You thought you didn't need me? Well, I sat here and I watched you get your ass whooped because you thought you didn't need me. And then Mickey has like the tears in her eyes and she's like, how could you do that, right? And so then <laughs> she, but then she gets real, right? She gets, she's just like, at first I'm hurt because you're my friend. But then she's like, she realized, well, F me, then F you. And she smacks the piss out of Chelsea Green. Yeah. Like there's so many wrestling slaps that are like wrestling slaps. And you're like, yeah. come on. Go, man, go back and neck. watch this. She smacked the piss out of Chelsea Green. And then Chelsea Green slaps her back, and then Mickey smacks her back again. And then Chelsea Green smacks her, and I'm like, oh, man. But it's just, again, I love a good veteran, man. A good veteran. And Mickey, yo, give it up for Mickey James for this run she has had. Because, listen, like, the matches have not been perfect. Some of the matches have been, you know, a little overbooked. But as far as, like, selling the character, selling the feud, selling the matches, the emotions, stuff like this right here. And in the grand scheme of wrestling, this was for Chelsea Green, right? Right. This was to sell how important what Chelsea Green did to Mickey James was. And so Mickey and Chelsea start going at it. Chelsea slides out of the ring and then Mickey stands up and uh, Matt Cardona is behind Mickey James. He jumps up and gives her that jumping leg drop thingy that he does. And, you know, he's a big tough guy who leg drops women, so he's cool. <laughs> and, um, and then you got it, man. You got Matt Cardona and Chelsea Green in, in the uh, <laughs> standing in the ring, and they're the couple you love to hate. So they are here. They're together now in Impact Wrestling. This is something we've been seeing on the indies. It's been very popular, and now it's here on Impact TV. And I'm here for it. I think this can be a lot of fun. I do too. Uh, they can. They can definitely. I don't want to compare it to the McMahon Helmsley era or anything like that, but I mean they can do a pretty good power couple storyline if they decide to put Cardona on top. You know, he's going to be the digital champion for a while, and he'll she'll probably be the knockouts champion here before too long. Right. But we knew that this was coming. But they did a pretty good job of, of really making us wait. But they didn't push it too long to where it's like, oh, my God, get it over with already. Right. You know, they they did a good job. They dragged it out a little bit. We talk about we want some kind of long-term stories and they don't ru- and not to rush things. And the difference with this is that they didn't do it. Chelsea didn't do it to get the knockouts title. 
And that's where everyone thought it was going. You know, well, yes, she's going to be the one that gets, you know, gets a title. She, it, it was, I mean, it's going to be a feud between Mickey James and Chelsea Green with nothing to do with the Knockouts Championship. And that's what I've been talking about forever now. Like, when are we going to get a feud that doesn't have anything to do with the title? Yeah. Kind of did something with Giselle Shaw and Lady Frost, but then they ended up just uh, being in a title match anyway. So, yep. you know, th- this is the first time in, in really like a long time that wasn't the undead realm that we just got two knockouts that are just going to have a feud and it doesn't need the fucking belt. So, yeah, um, yeah. she looked. It, Chelsea, the, the thing uh, that, that worries me a little bit about this, though, is I feel like Tasha Stills is getting a little lost in this shuffle and I hate that for her. Like, yeah. she's got to go out of her way to make herself hot, keep herself hot while they're doing this other stuff. Because she doesn't want to be the champion who's the afterthought. Right, because this is a bit now, this is a challenge for Impact's creative team. How can we make Mickey James and Chelsea Green a, a priority? Make continue to make Deanna Perrazzo a priority with her two championships and the Champ Champ Challenge and her, whoever her who ultimately is gonna come in and be a big deal to to cha- to challenge her. How do we keep all that relevant, keep it interesting, and then make Tasha take Tasha steals and get her to the next level? You know, right. I see a, a scenario where she is an afterthought as the champion. She's wrestled one match as champion and she got pinned already. Yeah. Um, well, she's wrestled two matches because she she you know wrestled Mickey, but the very first match she got pinned in a tag team match. You, you know, so. I'm a little concerned about it that she's just going to be talking all this shit because she's got the the belt, you know, and they got the knockouts tag team titles, which which they're trying to have a pretty relevant feud with inspiration and 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 uh, influence, which I, which I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm not going to say that I'm not, but they've got their work cut out for them with the knockouts right now. Yeah. They haven't had this much going on in forever. And, but that's a good thing, though. That's a good yeah. problem to have. That's a good problem to have. And like you mentioned, you got uh, you got you got Deanna Perrazzo, who has basically a segment that listen, she's a made woman. She's made. She can just do that segment for a couple of months going forward. And then, you know, every now and then give her a, a, a real challenger and just let her work the matches. Let her work the matches and talk her junk and just be out there just killing people as the champ champ. That's fine. So boom, she's got this. She can live, right? That's good. Like you don't have to do a whole lot of massaging to that. You know what I'm saying? Like you just got to just let her do her thing. So, and that's, by the way, that's where you want to be. Also, if anybody saw that, that t-shirt that Tasha Steele's had on uh, the red, it said like, uh, it said petty across it. I wanted that shirt. I tried to buy it, but they didn't have no three X, you know, a brother big out here, a brother big out here. <laughs> and so, uh, so I couldn't get one, but Listen, Tasha, if you're watching this, stock has some 3X. I got you. I got you. Who Who is Tasha? No, I, I know I'm going to get off topic because we're going to talk about Chelsea a little bit more. But who's Tasha going to have a feud with now? That's There's a not question. a. Uh, that's a good question. I would. I would try yeah. to heat up Rosemary, to be honest. But Is that. Can, can we have a, an honest conversation? Is, the, is that possible? Can you heat up Rosemary? I mean, listen, anybody can be heated up, but yeah. I think that takes, I think, I think heating up, really heating up Rosemary is like a three month process at this point. Do you, you got to that... come out there and really start like beating some people and like effectively looking like a true contender? No, you're, you're right. Because at this point there are a lot of, you know, I, I've been asking for storylines, but there's so many knockouts in, in involved in storylines you don't have Jordan any grace is, is free. She's a baby face. So I can see they can do, okay. they can do Jordan grace. She had uh she recently, she lost the digital media championship. So that frees her up. Um, who do you think they could, you think they could return Sue young as a baby face at this point? She just had a baby. <laughs> I know, but it's been, a, it's been a few months now. Like, I don't know what. I, I, well, I, I'd be I'd be shocked if she's ready. I'd be yeah, shocked. It sounds like a little early. Yeah, a little soon. I think like coming. Listen, like Ronda Rousey is a world class athlete. Like she was 
an Olympian in judo, you know, a UFC champion, all of that. And she came back at the Royal Rumble this past January. Yeah, you got yeah, after right. having a baby. And, you know, she was it, she was clearly not, you know, in the shape that she would want to be in. Um so you're, I, just, you're I, just, right. I yeah, man, I just think that like, you know, having a baby like, you know, like it. You, not only are you like you know you're, you're forced to be sedentary for a little while you know what i mean like it's just i, I think it's tough it, it not only is it just like a, getting your getting your your physical shape back where you need to be then you got to get your uh you got to get your wind up yeah know? true so uh and then you know then you gotta get your ring timing back so i i, I just i think it's a process and i applaud all the women who do it um, but I, I it, it, it sounds like a true like undertaking. Speaking of which, if anybody follows um, Lacey Evans on uh, on on Instagram, her Instagram's a lot of fun. Like she just she she posts like about her home life and she posts like you know videos of her training and it's like it's really inspirational. Honestly, like you know what I mean she'd be in there you know her kids and her husband and you know getting her shape, getting her form back. You know what I mean doing her thing. It's good stuff. It's, she, she's a good follow on social media. So. Going back to Chelsea here real quick, they did a, they did a good job of setting this up, and and even though it was something we knew it was it was going to happen, it wasn't like we were saying with Mike Bailey and Ace Austin, where it was just predictable and just get to it already. This was different because it was a story where it wasn't so t- it was tele. I mean, we knew what the end result was going to be. Chelsea was going to turn heel. I, I said it before. Every time you start using the word friend in wrestling, yeah. it means whoever you're turn, talking about is going to turn on you. 100%. But, it, but we were waiting for how how were they going to get there? How was it going to happen? What was, what's, you know, and her coming and setting up the chair and just watching her and then you could see Mickey James looking like she was crying and reaching out for her and all this. She's like, that, that's good television, man. That That's good stuff. And the, the Cardona shit was real shitty. Um, hitting, <laughs> hitting the radio silence on her. Um, at the multiverse of matches, they got the mixed tag match with Nick Aldis coming. Yeah, Impact could have really used that match for Rebellion. Maybe Aldis never wants to work with Impact again. But you know, on a, on a tell as far as a television show or pay per view. Yeah. But yeah. man, Rebellion could have used this match. That that's. You yeah, I, I think I, I think that um I think I think Nick Aldis is um somebody just kind of knows his worth. And I think he's somebody that could still I think he could still have a decent run and impact, but they just they'd have to be willing to pay him. You know what I mean? They have to be willing to pay him, um, pay him enough to 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 be what they need him to be. You know what I mean? Like like I think Nick Aldis has uh kind of set himself up to be able to say, I'm selling myself as a top guy. Like if you need a top guy, I'm here for you. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be cheap. You're going to have to pay me. And then you, you pay me and you feature me and I'll deliver on what you're paying me, you know? Um, and I don't know. I, I think that I'm sure that there's conversations have probably been had, you know, cause Scott Demore seems like he's always looking for a new talent to add. Um, but I don't know if, um, I don't know, you know, like, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. They don't have like a vacancy. Listen, I think it'd actually be cool if they brought in Nick Aldis for like three months to feud with Moose. That'd be cool. Like if you wanted to extend the, this concept of like, of, of trying to, you know, create a detour to get Josh Alexander back, uh, back to the world title. Right. Like, let's say let's say we say we're going to do Josh Alexander. We're going to push this all the way out to bound for glory. And so we need somebody for Moose to to bring it to, to feud with. It. So you bring in Nick Aldis. You know what I mean? Have him just go through the ringer, ringer, ringer. Boom, 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 boom. And then have him get a title shot. Big match. Nick Aldis versus Moose. Moose wins. And then, you know, move on to Josh Alexander. Yeah. I don't Good think one. they'll drag that out that long, but. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> I think it happens at Rebellion. Yeah, definitely. But then it's like, but then what, you know, then what, like, why, like, what, what's the rush? What's the rush? And I think like, I don't think Moose has done a bad job as champion by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I, I don't know that they've done everything they can do with him. 
Like, again, I put the onus on the television production to make the champion feel, like, make the character, any character, feel a, like a big, important deal. So that's 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 on impact if he doesn't feel like a big deal to you. Yeah. So, all right, man. I think, uh, I think we're about to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, you got any last thoughts? Any last thoughts on the show? Uh, negative. Just um, didn't love negative. it. Negative. Always but, negative. Yeah, yeah, always negative. <laughs> Fuck the cool factor, man. Um, no, I just uh, – wasn't my favorite episode, but they, the end was great. It was They did a really good job with that. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. The, the crowd is engaged. It's been a hot crowd. Let's see if they continue to have fun. You know, they – Turn the fucking lighting on in that place, man. Yeah. Turn it on. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Impact is definitely trending in the right direction, man. I'm, I'm here for it. Um, so listen, everybody, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, that's all we got for today. Um, re- like I said before, make sure you like, comment, rate, and subscribe. And the most important thing you can do if you like this show is tell a friend to tell a friend. BQ, tell the people where they can find you out here in these social media streets. Check me out at BQ Speaks on Twitter, the most negative Twitter account of all time. Hey, 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 hey. (laughs) Um, You can find me at TW Talking About on your social media of choice. You can also follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. You can go right now over to the Talking About Pod YouTube channel and subscribe over there. And um, yeah, like I said, let's bring more people into the conversation. We'll be back at you next week for BQ I'm T.W. Peace.